May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Has anybody not reminisced about the good old days? I mean, anybody over 50. I know nobody younger usually does. And I, real, I just realized that recently. It's like, when I was a kid, I don't remember. Well, I guess now those were the good old days. But when I hear other people sometimes think about, talk about the good old days and, and how they miss them, and I think, yeah, but we're talking about out, porta potties or outside outhouses. No dishwashers? No microwaves? Well, I guess, though, there were other things that were celebrated then. But why is it human tendency to think of the past as the good old days? It's, we think of it as a better, more ideal time than what it is right now, right here in the here and now. Well, the prophet Haggai apparently thought so, too. Very little is known about Haggai. <clears throat> We're given no family name or historical uh, lineage. But maybe this is just a way of bringing our fo focus and attention to the messenger and uh, to the message and not the messenger. When they returned to Judah after spending almost 60 years in Babylon, the people were trying to bring back what they remembered as the glories of their pre-exile existence. But you know, Murphy's Law, nothing had gone as expected in the rebuilding of the temple. That is, until the little-known prophet, Haggai, brings the word of God to them. And although his prophetic activity is said to have been short, maybe only three months. I mean, when we, talk, when we think about prophets, we think about them having a long lifeline as far as their prophecies. But Hagar wasn't like that. This is where he was important. This is where God used him. So even though his, his prophecy was lasted no longer than three months, it is significant enough that it's found in the scriptures. Now, one of the lessons from Haggai's story is clear. God calls and uses whomever God wants. And in, in this text, Haggai is speaking to Judah on God's behalf. Those listening include some who were living before the temple's destruction and those who were too young to witness the horror. All have been returned from exile, though. Cyrus, the emperor of Persia, has permitted the Jews to come back home and to rebuild. He actually said, go back, rebuild your temple. But before you think that Cyrus is a nice guy, the Persians just had a different approach than the Babylonians. The Babylonians came in, destroyed everything, hit people over the head, took them away to Babylonia, where they lived in exile for nearly 60 years. So the, even being released now by the Persians, the children of the covenant weren't given full freedom because the bonds of being conquered were loosened during the reign of Cyrus, who wanted to be portrayed as a liberator. He wanted history to say good things about him. He wanted to be remembered as benevolent. So he returned some of the freedoms to the people living under his domination, his dominion. The Persian kings weren't true liberators because liberation can't exist unless the people are free. So receiving portioned freedoms will, will give you this freedom, 
but you're still under our rule. So receiving those portion freedoms is a poor substitute for self-rule and autonomy. But during times of rapid change, it's tempting to look back longingly on a selectively remembered past. While space should be allowed for appropriate grief over these changes, excessive living in nostalgia is going to slow down the rebuilding. It's going to slow down the community from living into its future. Also, this text encourages us to be sensitive to persons with different experiences of the past. For, for example, some white Americans can look back at the 1950s and remember the good old days. And yet, many African Americans remember that same period in time as a time of institutionalized segregation and racial injustice. So we see the good old days aren't good for everyone. The Jews' commitment to temple reconstruction is lagging. After nearly 60 years without a temple, the people have changed priorities and they're no longer worried about trying to complete this, this structure. In, five, in 15 years, they got very little done until Haggai came. But they weren't interested in the temple. They were more interested in their own homes, rebuilding their homes and their lives and their security rather than reestablishing the center of the faith community. As the center of the community, though, the gathering place of the people to worship God and the point by which the Jews would orient their lives, the temple was really essential to bring them fully back into God's fold. Haggai has asked the aging members of the community who remember the details of the old temple to comment on the progress that's been made. They tell the community that the work doesn't come near the level of grandeur and magnificence. And the quality of handiwork being done, it's just not, it's just not up to par with what was there before. It's likely the goal of rebuilding the temple to an even higher state seems unattainable to them so they figure, why even bother? The church can't and shouldn't live on what was in the past. That's not to say we shouldn't remember our past and remember the past. But we can't live on what was in the past. No one wants to hear, that's the way we've always done it. And it's easy to make the actual building the focus of a congregation's expectation rather than hear the call of God to be the church, the kingdom of God, here and now in this place. And finally, God reminds us through Haggai of two realities that are appropriate in any congregation at any hour. First, we're not in this alone. And I think maybe too many times we don't hear this. I mean, we think of God. We pray. But we are not in this alone. We don't need to produce all the resources to build the house of God in the kingdom of heaven because our God is a God of abundance who will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and all the nations. Our God has filled this house with glory. I hope you feel that when you walk in. Our God is here with us 
our God is in the next state with family. The promises of God are promises of abundance in the past, in the present, and in the future. Second, the move into the future isn't just a repeat of the past and a faint echo of former glory. In God's future, we're moving toward and recreating an outpouring of wonder, grace, beauty, power, and love. To the people who are discouraged about their lackluster attempt at construction in comparison with the magnificent temple of Solomon, Yahweh requests that they not look at yesterday, but that they look towards tomorrow. Don't look at what's behind you. Look at what's in front of you. When, once again, in a little while, God says, I will shake those heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will be there and all the treasures of the nations will come to us. We're not talking material, all material things. There were were some material things in with that thought things that would be returned to the temple that were taken by the Babylonians, those were to be returned. But the solemn declaration refers to future events too, future events that we're going to see happening in the world. And maybe not even in our lifetime, maybe in our children's or grandchildren's. The Lord declares through his prophet Haggai that the latter splendor of this house is going to be greater than the former. And the glory of the rebuilt temple will be greater than the glory of Solomon's temple. But its greatest glory, of course, will be the presence of God. Isn't that something? The Holy One is the true liberator. The kingdom will come. Take courage. Amen.